This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. everyone, I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are TNT Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Hi, Tanya. How are you today? I'm so great. How are you? I'm doing well. Are you ready for today's story? I am so ready. You told me it's going to be really good. This is a good one. This is a good one. This is a good one. They're I all promise. Good they're all good ones. I mean, they're pissers. Yes. Which is so good. This this does have kind of a pisser ending. But they it, all have pisser endings. <laughs> but there are some really good things that happen. Oh. Oh. And I mean good like in a genuine good way. Not a euphemism for grotesque. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Morbid. I promise. No. Fascinating. All right, then. Let's get this started. Let's start, Tanya. You're wasting time. Our story begins in the early morning of June 7th, 1998. On that morning, a six-year-old girl named Brooke awoke to noises in the kitchen. She was spending the night at her grandmother's house, and Grandma always slept on the couch. She was sleeping in her grandmother's room. She woke up to these noises. She was confused and sleepy, and she wandered into the kitchen to find someone attacking her grandmother. Her grandmother was 58-year-old Judith Johnson, and Judith's home was in Barberton, Ohio. It was really dark, but Brooke saw a man attacking her grandmother, and she said he was holding what looked to be maybe a knife or like a pole. She was really scared, uh, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So she ran back into her grandmother's bedroom where she was sleeping. She jumped in the bed and she hid under the covers. She pretended to be asleep because she was really hoping. (gasps) Yeah. (laughs) She was really hoping like whoever was in the house would just go away. But that didn't happen, unfortunately. So huddled under the covers, feverently wishing that this person would just go away. Brooke was terrified. The same man that attacked her grandma came into the bedroom and found her underneath those covers. He savagely beat Brooke. She's she's six. I know. And she was knocked out, thankfully, because he raped her and left her for (gasps) dead. And thankfully, to this day, Brooke does not remember the attack on her. She woke up the next morning, and she was wearing a pink nightgown that her grandmother had given her. It was now covered in blood. Is that what she was wearing the night before? Yes. And she wandered into the living room area, and she found her grandma's body. Oh, no. I know. She screamed and she yelled, Grandma, wake up, wake up. But unfortunately, Judy was dead. She had been strangled and beaten so badly that her nose, jaw, collarbone, and skull were all broken. Judy had also been sodomized. (gasps) Brooke found a phone and called a neighbor for help. She's a smart little girl. She was a very smart little girl. The neighbor wasn't home. Oh, that's some bad luck. Mm Mm-hmm. And Brooke left a heartbreaking message on this neighbor's answering machine. The message that she left on the answering machine, she said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but my grandma died and I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Somebody killed my grandma. Now, please, would you get a hold of me as soon as you can? Bye. Stop. Stop it. Stop. I know. Poor little Brooke. Oh, my God. Stop. So after she leaves this message. Just give me a second time. I know. <laughs> Because you, you played that one real well, by the way. <laughs> Your drama lessons are okay, paying good. off. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Okay. I know, right? God, and you've had to do it so passionately. I know. Please help. Please help me. God, where's the tissue? She's a little waif. She's six. Oh. After Brooke got the neighbor's answering machine, she decided to try the other next door neighbor. She went to the next door neighbor to ask for help. Oh, so she went next door. She went next door. She didn't call. Gotcha. Yeah, after she, yes, after she made the phone call and didn't get anyone, she decided to physically go next door. The resident of that home was named Tanya Brazel. And when Tanya answered the door, Brooke told her that her grandmother was dead and that she had been attacked. Tanya told Brooke, whose little cherub face was now swollen and bruised, 
to wait on her porch because she was feeding her children breakfast. Shut the fuck up. And do you know how long she had Brooke stay on that porch before she finally helped her? No. It was between 30 and 45 minutes. This is a fucking joke. It's this not is a, joke. a fucking joke. You're going to say this is a joke throughout this entire story, but no, this is the first time you're going to say this. How could a human being do that? A grown woman leaves a six-year-old on her porch in a bloody nightgown with bruises on her face and has her wait 30 to 45 minutes. I'm on fire now, Tanya. <laughs> After waiting that time, Tanya finally took Brooke home. And I don't know how she knew where she lived. That part was never made clear. But she did know where Brooke l- lived and she took her home. Well, wasn't it her neighbor? Mm-hmm. But she was at her grandma's house. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. She, when you say home, you don't mean back to no, grandma. No, I mean back to home Okay, home. I thought you meant, okay, gotcha. When Brooke arrived home, her mother, April, was there, who is Judy's daughter. And April completely freaked out, of course, because who wouldn't? Wait, the neighbor didn't call the police? No. No, she did not. (laughs) Even though you describe Brooke as having bloody pajamas on. And a bruised face. April said that Brooke was barely recognizable, and she was covered in blood head to toe. Didn't take her to the hospital? Not yet. Okay. April asked her what had happened, and Brooke told her that Judy had been stabbed to death and a man had attacked both of them. Brooke's father was there when she told April what happened, and he immediately ran out of the house and went to Judy's house. He found Judy's body where Brooke had said it was, and he called the police. Brooke's mother then asked, do you know who it was that attacked you? Surprisingly, Brooke said she did. She said that he looked like Uncle Clarence. Uncle Clarence was Clarence Elkins, who was the husband of April's sister, Melinda. And April and Melinda were both Judy's daughters. April's family was really close to Melinda's family, and Brooke knew Uncle Clarence very well. They always spent time with each other. So based on this ID from Brooke, police swarmed Melinda's home and arrested Clarence. He was charged with aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, rape, and felonious assault. However, Melinda, Clarence's wife, was convinced that her husband of 18 years was not the killer. She said she 100% knew he wasn't the killer because she had been home the night of the murder, up with a sick child, And Clarence had been at a bar drinking with friends. Her home that she shared with Clarence was 40 minutes away from Judy's home. Well, did his friends verify he was out there drinking? Mm Mm-hmm. Clarence also said that night he had drank quite a bit and he was in no shape to make a 40-minute drive to Judy's house. Yeah, that don't mean you didn't. (laughs) I'm just saying. Police, however, were convinced that Clarence was the perpetrator. You'd think Brooke knew. Police relied heavily on Brooke's eyewitness identification of Uncle Clarence and also friends of Judith's testified at the trial that Melinda and Clarence's relationship was shaky. Following Judy's murder, Melinda's family was really hurt and furious with her. They did not understand why she would lie for Clarence. And support him. Right, and she was sticking up for a man that murdered her mother. They think that she actually lied for him? They do. At the beginning, they do. Oh. Melinda's sister, April had a very close relationship, as I had mentioned with Melinda and Clarence. Right after this happened and Melinda was sticking up for Clarence, they stopped talking to one another. At Judy's funeral, April and the rest of Melinda's family shunned her. So she was left to grieve all alone without her sister, without her husband, because Clarence is arrested in jail. Her mom is murdered. Her mom is murdered. Her, her niece, niece was has been, raped. Yeah, her niece has been raped. And she's all alone. And she's all alone. She stood at her mother's grave. And she promised her mother that she was going to find out who did this to her and Brooke because she did not believe that Clarence did it. However, this was quite a tall order for Melinda because... She's not a private investigator. She's not a private she's investigator. She's not a police officer. She had mounting legal costs. So oh, she was running yeah. out of money. Lawyers are expensive. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> and she had lost her home and her job recently. <gasps> so she was really... It's just getting shit on. Yeah, shit on just shit get, Hitting everywhere. the skids, right? Clarence's trial began a year after the murder in 1999. Brooke was the star witness for the prosecution. At one point in the trial, the prosecutor asked her to point out the person who had attacked her and her grandmother. She pointed to Uncle Clarence, who sat at the defense table with his wife seated right behind him, and the rest of Melinda's family sat on the other side of the courtroom. Did the DNA evidence come back? Yes, the DNA evidence did come back, and it did not match Clarence. But all the jury really needed was that eyewitness testimony for Brooke. 
After deliberating for only 13 hours, they came back with a verdict. Clarence was guilty of murder, aggravated assault, and three counts of rape. He was sentenced to life in prison and would not be eligible for parole until 2054. That's a long time from now. <laughs> it is a long time from this now. And this happened, yes, and this <laughs> happened like 20 years ago. After hearing the verdict, Melinda was crushed. She believed in her heart that the court had just convicted an innocent man and sent him away for prison for basically the rest of his life. Did they have kids together? They did. They had two sons. As Clarence was led away, Melinda told him that she loved him and that this wasn't over. She was determined to not let this case be closed forever. What well, I feel like uh, Clarence is getting... Get, getting the railroad. <laughs> railroaded. Because the he ass. is. Up the ass. <laughs> I'm just going to give you my opinion because he is. Because otherwise this would be the end of the, uh, end of the episode, right? <laughs> exactly. And Clarence goes away. And Clarence goes away, the end. Armed with what she believed was the truth, she decided she was going to learn everything that she could about crime investigation. Melinda figured that if she could just find something, some evidence, somehow, she would be able to prove to the police and the court that Clarence did not commit this crime. So the very first thing that Melinda did, and I thought this was hilarious, was she turned to the show Forensic Files for help. She said she watched it every chance she got. Me too. And what she learned, she tried to learn everything she could about forensic science and criminal science. Me too. I know, right? That's how I know a lot of stuff. (laughs) She also hired a private investigator named Martin Yant. He had worked on 12 cases that had led to exonerations of wrongly convicted defendants. Martin agreed to take her case, even though he believed the case was stacked against her. He also told her he would teach her some investigative techniques to help her learn to be a good detective. Melinda's becoming a badass. Oh, yeah. She's like, I am going to make sure the court knows that Clarence didn't do this. Martin told Melinda that even though he believed they had an uphill battle, he knew that eyewitness testimony was very unreliable, especially testimony from a traumatized six-year-old. He also told Melinda that he believed the police did a piss-poor job concerning the DNA. They had collected pubic hair, head hair, and seminal fluid from both Brooke and her grandmother during their investigation And they had not done thorough testing, which made Martin wonder how thorough was the actual investigating of the case. Yeah, because you could find definitely find out if there was a match to him in 1998. And they did do DNA testing to match it against Clarence, and his DNA was not at the crime scene. Okay. There was no fingerprints at the crime scene, nothing to tie Clarence to the crime scene except for Brooke's eyewitness testimony. His DNA did not match the semen on Brooke or the grandma. No. Really? 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 Really. That's messed up. I know. This whole case was messed up. So now Melinda has the knowledge that she's gained from Martin and from forensic files. She starts looking into her mom's life and making a list of all the men that Judy knew. She visited bars where some of them hung out and she would flirt with them to try to get a DNA sample. She spent a lot of time doing this. She knew from forensic files that she could get DNA from hair, a beer glass, a cigarette butt, So she did everything she could to try to get these samples. I love this woman. I love this woman, too. She is a hero in my book. She was totally on a mission. She did collect quite a few samples, but she ran into a roadblock. It was going to be very expensive to DNA test all of these samples, and Melinda just didn't have the funds to do it. That'd be a lot of money and take some time. Yes. Martin told Melinda that besides the DNA testing, they also needed to find out how sure Brooke really was that Uncle Clarence had attacked her and Judy that night. Martin told Melinda it was time for her to get back in touch with her family. It had been three years since Judy's murder, and April and Melinda had not spoken during those three years. But Melinda gathered up the courage and decided she's going to go visit April, and she decided to do it unannounced. She just showed up at the door one day. She went to April's home and knocked on the door. Rip off that Band-Aid. April opened the door. Surprise! Surprise! It's me! And the two sisters stared at each other and not saying a word, started to cry and hug each other. They really missed each other. Brooke was home that day too, and at first she also hesitated in approaching Melinda, but after a few moments, Brooke, who is now nine, started hugging her aunt too. They all missed each other. Once they settled down and got to talking, Melinda found out what she had come there for. Brooke had a secret about that night that she and Judy were attacked. Oh, Brooke. A secret. (sighs) A secret. 
And before I tell you the rest of the story, Talia... Don't do it. Don't, don't, no, no, not yet. It's time for a shameless okay, plug. Okay, all right, all right. I love shameless plugs because <laughs> I have no shame. That's why I love them. Plug away. Hey, everyone. If you go to our website, tntcrimes.com, you can find full unreleased episodes available for individual purchase. You can also join our membership where you get unlimited access to all of our unreleased episodes and early releases, mini episodes, and so many other awesome things. So go to TNTCrimes.com. And thanks again for all your support. And we're back. We're back. Tell me more. She said she was no longer sure that Uncle Clarence was the perpetrator. She had also seen a picture of Clarence. And after seeing that picture, she was even more sure. She said Uncle Clarence had brown eyes and the man that attacked her had blue eyes. Is it, You mean three years later when she saw the picture again of him? Mm-hmm. Okay. You can only imagine how Melinda felt at this point. She was over the moon. Ecstatic. She was thinking, oh my God, all we have to do is tell the court that Brooke said it's not Uncle Clarence anymore and we can get Clarence out of the Yeah, slammer. just call up the court. Hey. Hey. Brooke's going to come in. She's got some, a secret to tell you. Melinda was positive that Clarence would get a new trial based on this information. However, the judge denied Melinda's request for a new trial and said that he believed Brooke's recanting her testimony was something that was coerced by Melinda. Yeah, I was going to say she's been influenced. Yes. Melinda is back at square one. Piss her. Piss her. But she's a little bit ahead because her family is now, I'm guessing. On board. On board. There's strength in numbers. There is strength in numbers. Hashtag strength in numbers. (laughs) (laughs) Around this time, the court had agreed to give Melinda access to the DNA evidence recovered from the crime scene. And if you remember, she had a bunch of those samples to test, but she didn't have the money to do it. So she organized fundraisers. And kept that story in the media. She was always contacting the press. So is this like 2001, maybe? Yeah, I would say, yes, I would say this is probably around 2001. Through those fundraisers, she was able to raise about $40,000. It was also around this time that she decided she needed some real legal help. And she, uh, yeah, I think. Yes, finally, <laughs> right? I think she needed that in 1998. And what's up with his defense lawyer? No offense to whoever that is, but damn. So Melinda contacted the Ohio Innocence Project, which was located at the University of Cincinnati Law School. The program had been recently created to help free wrongly convicted defendants and was a service that was provided at no cost. John Godsey, who was a former prosecutor, was the head of the program. And after Melinda told him the story, he was intrigued. He said the fact that she was the victim's daughter gave her a lot of credibility considering you don't usually have victims' families fighting so hard to free someone that had been convicted of murdering their family member. Well, it's a perfect case for the Innocence Project because there's untested DNA. Exactly. After having a very lengthy conversation with Melinda, John decided the Innocence Project would take the case, and Melinda could not have been more excited. As you had just mentioned, in reviewing the case, John discovered that DNA had not been a deciding factor in Clarence's case, and there was a lot of it that hadn't been tested. There was close to 50 items containing DNA on the case's evidence list that had not been tested. Why Clarence's attorney didn't mandate testing is shocking. I am shocked, too. John had to decide between the 50 items that had not been tested what we should test first. He found a lab that would test two samples, whatever he picked out, at half their price, and that was $25,000. (gasps) Damn, now you can go to CVS and get a kit. (laughs) Yeah, you can, can't you? (laughs) The two pieces of evidence that John decided to test first was the DNA collected from Judith's body, which was semen, and to test the DNA that was found in Brooke's underwear. Both samples were tested and revealed that there was male DNA present. When compared to Clarence's DNA, there was a 0% chance it was his. John was sure this is what they needed to free Clarence, but he was wrong. 
The court stated that because the prosecutor had convicted Clarence based on eyewitness testimony and not DNA, the jury still would have convicted him based on the same eyewitness testimony and not the DNA, no matter what the results were, and even though the results did not match Clarence. That's fucked up. That is totally fucked up. Because, you know what? Let me tell you why that is not necessarily true. Had they known it didn't match Clarence, they might have doubted the eyewitness testimony. Exactly. They would not have convicted him, I would think, beyond a reasonable doubt. That would certainly nag it my, in the back of my brain. Yeah. So here we are where the court will not let Brooke recant her testimony and they won't accept DNA that didn't match. At this point, Melinda wondered, what the hell do I need to do to get the court to pay attention? She thought to herself, do I need to serve this killer up on a silver platter, like actually find the real person? That won't work either. Well, she thought, if that's what they want, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, okay. She was determined. Okay. I'm telling you, this lady was determined as all hell. Melinda went back to the beginning of the case. Melinda went back to the beginning and reviewed the evidence. She went back to the day of the murder and thought about how Brooke went to that neighbor's house and that neighbor had Brooke wait on the porch for more than a half an hour before she finally took her home. Goddamn bitch. Right? The neighbor hadn't called the police or an ambulance, even though you clearly see a child that is hurt. Wait a second, Tanya. Hmm. Sorry, that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Hmm. Melinda thought this was weird. That is weird. Why wouldn't she have done that? I just thought it was because she was a bitch. But I should have thought more. Right? Around the same time, Melinda was reading the newspaper and a story caught her eye. It was about a man named Earl Mann who had recently been convicted of raping three children under the age of 10. And what caught her eye in the article was the name Tanya Brazel. Tanya, why is that name familiar? She was the neighbor who had answered the door when Brooke came asking for help the morning after Judy's murder. Melinda discovered that Tanya Brazell was Earl Mann's common-law wife, and then it all clicked for Melinda. Wow. Earl was a lifelong criminal, was a sexual predator, and he had just been released from prison in June 1998, right around the time Judy was murdered. All the police had to do was look next door. Hello? When you got a sexual predator next door who rapes kids. And a woman who's letting some a six-year-old just sit outside. And nobody questioned that. Melinda, just like we just said, thought that a sexual predator and recent parolee made a very compelling suspect. In re-reviewing the evidence, Melinda was also struck by what Brooke had said in that first phone call she had made to that neighbor. The one that you reenacted? Yes, the one that I reenacted that message. (laughs) In that phone message, she had said, somebody killed my grandma, and not Uncle Clarence killed my grandma. Melinda suspected that maybe when Brooke showed up to Tanya Brazell's house, and during the car ride over to Brooke's house, Tanya may have coached Brooke to claim it was Clarence that attacked her and Mm. killed Judy to steer Brooke away from her violent boyfriend. It should also be noted that Tanya testified at trial that Brooke told her her uncle had attacked her. She was the one that brought it up. Oh, I don't like this Tanya. And I normally like Tanya's. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like this one. I don't like this one either. Melinda decided she needed to find out a way to get the DNA of Earl Mann. At first, she tried writing him letters in prison. She pretended to be a lonely woman looking for a romantic pen pal. (laughs) I saw your online prisoner profile. (laughs) Exactly. And you seem like a real charmer. (laughs) She said she wrote 18 letters to Earl, and he did not respond to one. She was hoping that he would write her back and that he would lick the envelope or a stamp or something, and she would get the DNA. Despite the fact he did not write her back, she was still determined she was going to find a way to get his DNA. Melinda found out that Earl had recently been transferred to the Mansfield Correctional Institution in Mansfield, Ohio. This prison was the very same prison Clarence was serving out his sentence. Oh, God damn! You know, talk about all the stars aligning. If I was Clarence, I'd rip his eyes out. (laughs) Then she discovered something else that was crazy. She found out Earl was in Clarence's same cell block. She knew it had to be done. Clarence would have to help her collect Earl's DNA. (laughs) I know. 
This sounded like so much like a movie to me, this whole story. You better not get sexually graphic. No, I won't. Okay, I promise. <laughs> Melinda set a plan in motion. She found out from Clarence that Earl smoked and told Clarence that if he could collect one of Earl's used cigarette butts and somehow smuggle it out of the prison, they could get it tested against the DNA from the crime scene. I like how you say somehow smuggle. Somehow. How you how you going to smuggle that, Tanya? Somehow. <laughs> somehow. We'll just leave it at somehow. <laughs> she told him to always carry with him a baggie and a clean tissue to collect the cigarette butt. There's that weirdo Clarence with his <laughs> tissue in his baggie. <laughs> Can you imagine this poor guy? Who is convicted of this crime, and he's in prison with all these violent offenders, and he's going to he's gonna sneak up on some dude that's violent and steal his cigarette butt. Put it in a baggie and smuggle it out of smuggle jail. Out. Prison somehow. Oh, my goodness. After weeks went by, Clarence finally found his opportunity. He saw Earl having a smoke, and he saw him put out the cigarette butt in a clean ashtray. After Earl left the scene, Clarence rushed over and collected the cigarette butt. He hurriedly took it back to his cell and stored it in a Bible. And he actually couldn't have collected this cigarette butt at a better time because Earl was transferred out of Clarence's cell block days after he got the cigarette butt. Two weeks after collecting the cigarette butt, Clarence finally found the opportunity to smuggle it out of the prison in a letter to one of his attorneys. He was fearful of getting caught, but at this point, he was beyond the point of no return because this DNA had to be tested. Yeah, what are they going to do to him? Put him in prison? I know. His attorney received it and immediately sent it to the lab for testing, and guess what? It matched. It matched the DNA from the crime scene. Both the samples collected from Judy's body and from Brooke's underwear. I am going to say there's a chain of custody issue there. involved <laughs> with this. But at least it it gives them the confidence that he's innocent. Yes, and maybe get some help. Yeah. Fearing the court would again deny this evidence, John Godsey from the Innocence Project decided to try another route instead of directly going to the prosecutor or the court to ask Clarence be released. He contacted the Ohio Attorney General. His name was Jim Petro. Petro listened to John and Melinda and felt the case was quite compelling. As a former prosecutor, Petro knew that the DNA was undeniable evidence. He conducted his own independent investigation into Clarence's case. He did private DNA tests as he had access to Earl Mann's DNA since Ohio collects DNA from all convicted felons. Yeah, they just started doing that in the early 2000s. After investigating for six weeks, he publicly pressured the prosecutor in Clarence's case to exonerate Clarence by holding a press conference. His press release stated that, Quote, we owe it to Mr. Elkins to move swiftly in granting him his freedom. We owe it to the victims to ensure that the right suspect, Earl Mann, is prosecuted for committing the crimes. Petro admitted this was a radical move. After all, his office works closely with prosecutors all over the state. I'm surprised he had to do all that because a prosecutor would be kind of embarrassed. You would think. The best part is the prosecutor still refused to reopen the case. He's like, fuck you. And... <laughs> And, That's my interpretation. Yeah, I know. And Jim Petro couldn't force the issue, but the heat is on. As we say, press, media. Mm-hmm. And Melinda did everything she could to keep it in the media. John Godsey tried another avenue. He found more DNA evidence that had not been tested. There was a pubic hair that had been found on Brooke's underwear, and John sent that to be tested. Again, it came back as a match for Earl Mann. Both Melinda and John were convinced the prosecutor could not continue to turn a blind eye with this new DNA evidence screaming that Earl committed this crime and not Clarence. And as I had mentioned earlier, John Godsey was a former prosecutor, and he had said in one of the articles that I had read that if he had seen the same evidence when he was a prosecutor, he would 100% believe that Earl was the killer. John and Melinda sent the test results to the prosecutor. It was 10 days before Christmas, and Melinda prayed that Clarence would be home to celebrate Christmas with her and their two sons after missing seven Christmases. As they waited for a response from the prosecutor's office, John and Melinda organized a press conference, and armed with the DNA test, were ready to demand Clarence's release. Minutes before the press conference, Melinda got the news she'd been working for since Clarence's conviction. The prosecutor was dropping all charges against Clarence, and he was going to be released. Yay! Yay! Happy story. 
And finally, on a cold day in December, right before Christmas... Clarence Elkins walked out of prison a free man. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Clarence. After his release, Clarence finally could let go of all the feelings that had been pent up during his incarceration. Because he had a lot of anger. Oh, I bet. He was very angry with the Barberton Police Department and the Summit County Prosecutor's Office. I'd have a whole list of people I was angry with. He had a whole list. He filed a lawsuit against the Barberton Police as well as the state of Ohio. The state of Ohio paid Clarence $1,075,000 in compensation for his wrongful imprisonment, but the police department fought him. It's much easier to get it from the state under the exoneration laws than to sue the police. In his suit against the police department, which also named specific detectives and officers who worked on the case, he claimed that the police officers failed to disclose to the prosecutor's office a memorandum that would have exonerated him exculpatory evidence exculpatory evidence and i'll go into it a little bit but the police department and the prosecutor's office tried to claim qualified immunity and state sovereign immunity which is the defense that you cannot sue the government or police for doing their job you can't fight city hall you really can't the memorandum that clarence referenced in his lawsuit had to do with something that happened on january 5th 1999 so this was maybe six months after judy was murdered On that date, Earl Mann had been arrested by the Barberton police for two strong arm robberies. And I didn't know strong arm? Strong arm robberies. And I didn't know what those are. But they're robberies in which a victim is surrounded by a group of individuals who brutally beat the victim while they rob that person. Really? I know. Is that real? It's real. Strong arm robbery. I got this information from the... Internet? (laughs) <laughs> no, from the appeals court case. This has got to be real then. <laughs> and it was the internet, but it's from the appeals court case. During the arrest, Earl, who was drunk, asked a patrol officer named Gerard Antonucci, quote, why don't you charge me with the Judy Johnson murder? <laughs> what? Officer Antonucci what? was like, what the hell? Uh... And in accordance with his training that mandated reporting anything that officers believe the detective bureau should know about. Antonucci wrote an interdepartmental memo stating what Earl had said to him and directed it to the department investigating Judy's murder. Did Earl elaborate a little bit? I mean, I I mumble some crazy shit when I'm drunk. You know, because I would have been like, what do you mean? I mean, I don't know why or if he even went into it more, but... There must have been something more to convince him enough to write it, because otherwise it's just a drunk person mumbling. Right. I mean, you could be mumbling, why don't you arrest me for Nicole Brown? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. That's true. The point is, a memorandum was written. Antonucci testified that he wrote the memo the same day Earl had said it, and he placed it in the mailbox, which was emptied each day by a member of the detective bureau, and then was disseminated to the detectives working on a specific case. So if it was about the Judy Johnson case, it would have went to those detectives. This memo was not disclosed to Clarence's defense team nor the prosecutors and was never produced at trial. This was a direct violation of Clarence's constitutional rights to due process and his rights to have a fair trial. Because as you mentioned, it's exculpatory evidence. But is a drunk person mumbling, why don't you arrest me for another crime? But they should have at least, right, investigated him. Like, why would he say that? Because he's drunk And then they would have said, oh, he lives next door. And they said, oh, Tanya made poor little Brooke stand on her porch for half an hour. Or they could just be, he's a drunk ass, yeah. dumb ass. They could. But you're right. They denied Clarence's um, counsel an opportunity to at least look into it. And I got this information from the appeals court decision. It was for the Sixth Circuit. The court reasoned that at trial, there was no dispute that Officer Antonucci had mailed the memo to the detective bureau. Where, no. did, they, where did they find this memo? In I don't, discovery? They never found this memo. So how did they know it existed? Because of Aud- Officer Antonucci. Oh, he just came out and said it. Because mm-hmm, he testified to it. Got it. The court reasoned at the trial there was no dispute that if Officer Antonucci had mailed the memo to the Detective Bureau, it would have been received by the Detective Bureau. And it was determined that no other important documents were missing from the case file at the police department, and the incident report of Earl Mann's arrest was received and preserved And it had been placed in the mailbox along with the memo. So they had that. They just mysteriously did not have the memo. They didn't get the memo. They didn't get the memo. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that, Flavia. (laughs) As I was reading this case, the appeals decision on Clarence's case, 
And being the law nerds that we are, Talia, I wanted to tell you that they quoted the opinion of the case we covered in episode 12. The no, truth can hurt you. they did. They did. Which was Moldawan versus the city of Warren. They, oh, I know that case well. I've read a thousand pages on it. They quoted it several times in wow. Clarence's case. Oh, I, I just got goosebumps. I know, me too. Look. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys haven't listened to that one. Listen to it. Listen to it. And you'll get another wrongful conviction story. It's fucked up. It is. It's messed up. The court also stated in their decision that the case against Clarence was flimsy at best. <laughs> yes. they, they said they relied on eyewitness testimony of a six-year-old who'd, who'd been, been knocked out who'd been attacked in the dark raped beaten and never clearly saw the attacker and was unconscious and was unconscious for most of the evening they also said the behavior of tanya brazel was quote highly unusual if not suspect shady exactly <laughs> namely she le- like we had mentioned she left brooke, brooke could have died she could have she doesn't I, know what's going on she's and a like, six-year- who leaves a six-year-old on the porch. God bless Brooke for staying on the porch. God bless her. I guess she just didn't know what else to do. They also pointed out that at Clarence's trial, the defense had several witnesses testify. Melinda testified Clarence was home with her 40 miles from Judy Johnson's home around the same time Judy was murdered. I thought she, he was at the bar drinking. He was. Oh. But they, he was at the bar drinking beforehand. He came home. She was up with a sick kid. They said Judy was killed somewhere around like 2.30 in the morning. And I think Clarence came home around 2.40. How did she actually die? She was strangled. She was strangled. She was, but it was and brutal. she was beaten brutally. At trial, also, Clarence had witnesses who testified they had been with Clarence earlier that evening at the bar drinking with him. The court further stated that the DNA had been collected at the scene and tested against Clarence's DNA, and there was no match. And all of this should have raised a red flag. The court finally stated in their opinion that if they were deciding whether the officers had been negligent in their failure to disclose the memo, the court would have decided they were more than negligent. But they did not decide this issue due to jurisdictional issues. Who was in charge of deciding that? The trial? The lo- lower? Yeah, the lower court. But they listed the following to support that statement. I feel like somebody's going to get spanked. <laughs> I feel like somebody's going to get spanked hard. Officers allegedly told Melinda after she discovered two bloody handprints on a lampshade in Judy's home that were not collected or put into evidence that they, quote, had enough evidence already. Oh, oh, oh God. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, you could also test a handprint, like a fingerprint. We don't, we don't need to. We have enough. We have enough. An alibi witness named Sue testified when she informed officers that she had seen Clarence the night of the murder and believed he did not commit the crime. They allegedly responded, quote, we got our man. We know for a fact that we have our man, end quote. And when she continued to protest, they allegedly told her that if she did not distance herself from Clarence and the case, she would end up in jail herself. What does that sound like? <laughs> Episode 12. Mm-hmm. You're, Absolutely. You're going to get life just like Jeff is. Yep. There was also a claim that one of the officers involved in the case allegedly falsified a police report to hide evidence that Brooke was unsure Clarence had attacked her. Now that's criminal. That is criminal. The court also said that Clarence had presented unrefuted evidence that the Earl Mann memo was mailed to the detective bureau, which were the officers investigating the case. Despite the anger that Clarence felt, he did not feel anger toward Brooke. Yeah, of course not. He said he felt nothing but forgiveness and love toward Brooke because, after all, she was a victim too. Yeah, a major victim, by the way. But Brooke has a really hard time forgiving herself. I've seen a couple, like, interviews from TV, and she really feels a lot of guilt over this. She's just a little girl. No, don't feel bad, Brooke. She said if it wasn't for her, Clarence would not have spent nearly eight years in prison. But Clarence says he wishes he could take the pain and guilt away from her because he just doesn't feel that way. The damage of Clarence's incarceration continued to affect everyone. Soon after his release, he and Melinda decided to divorce. No. Yes, this was the most heartbreaking. No. The years that had passed had destroyed their relationship and it couldn't be repaired. Hmm. I heard, I saw a quote from Melinda and she said something like, the feelings that you have as a wife, during her investigation, those feelings died. And so when he came out of prison, they just couldn't go back to where their relationship was. Yeah, I think that, you know, trying to help exonerate my husband from a murder might take some of the spark and romance (laughs) away. I mean... Maybe a little. A little. 
On June 29, 2007, Earl Mann was indicted for the rape of Brooke and the rape and murder of Judith Johnson. So what did they tell me? What do they think happened? It was a summer night. It was a warm summer night and Judy had her front door open. She had left like the screen door open and had opened her front door. What did we say? Never leave your doors open. Never leave your door and your windows open, people. You have a quote in one of our episodes. You said, I'd rather be alive inside my house warm than <laughs> I would. cold and dead. Exactly. <laughs> I'd rather be sweating it out in August in my house. So Earl Mann lives next door. He's a child molester. So he's he, a pedophile. He's that, a was, pedophile. that was the goal probably? That, yes. The goal was to attack Brooke. And I believe that Judy got in the way. But because, he sodomized her too. Yeah. And I think because he attacked Judy first. Here, I'll just let you tell you. That's okay. He attacked Judy first. But I believe Brooke was the ultimate goal. So Judy was just something he had to get past. So he didn't have to break in or anything because her door was open. He comes in. Judy's asleep on the couch. He attacks her. Because, what did he attack her with? Um, it was never made clear because he didn't have a gun with him or anything like that. Yeah, because I remember you told me she he, she said a pole or a knife. So I'm thinking he must have hit her with something. It was just never made clear to as to exactly what it was. So then when he could finally incapacitate Judy, he attacks her, rapes her, sodomizes her, whatever he does to her. Then finally he can go attack Brooke, who's a helpless child. And he thought he killed her. Imagine his surprise. Oh, man, he must have been really surprised. In August 2008, he pled guilty to aggravated murder, attempted murder, aggravated burglary, and rape, and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. So he admitted it? He admitted it. In November 2010, the city of Barberton agreed to settle Clarence's lawsuit brought against four officers, and they ended up giving Clarence $5.25 million. Wow. And that was in addition to the million plus he got from the state. But... His life is in shambles. I also saw that he suffers from PTSD. Yeah, I'm sure it wasn't a good time in prison. No, and he spent... He was, As a it was pedophile. Over, convicted exactly. pedophile. I can only imagine. And I really hope in my deepest heart that him and Melinda are still friends at least. Because yeah. she really... If it wasn't for her, he would still be in jail, I believe. Oh, yeah. She worked her ass off. And she is a hero. What's she doing now? She is actually working for the Innocence Project. The last I knew, she got a job with them. In Ohio? Mm-hmm, in Ohio. Shout out to the Innocence Project in Shout Ohio. Out. Yep. And you Michigan and all over. Some I know, each work. state has their own Innocence Project. And everybody listening to this, honestly, should go and look at their state's Innocence Projects. Usually it's in the universities. And, and look up this information because eyewitness testimony is one of the most unreliable forms of evidence. And a lot of people get exonerated based on DNA, like old DNA, because maybe the crimes happened in like the 70s or 80s. And now they're coming around and finding out after these people are incarcerated for 25 years, they get to be released. Well, that's my story, Talia. Well, I, yeah, that's, I've got a lot of different emotions. Good, bad. Hmm. I got to think about this stuff for a while now. I mean, I'm I'm happy he's out. I'm happy he's out. I just... And I'm not trying to shit on the police. I mean, they think... I, I, I'm convinced most of the time they think they've done the right thing. I do, too. And especially they probably saw Brooke, this little scared six-year-old, because I'm sure she was brought to the police department and interviewed by the cops, and they just really wanted to help her and put away the person that did it. And when she said her uncle did it, they were like, okay. And they didn't, they had their blinders on probably and didn't care what the DNA said. So, All Talia, right. where can everyone find us? Go to any of your favorite social medias and type in T and T Crimes and you'll find us. And then go to our website, TNTCrimes.com. Thank you all from the bottom and tops of our hearts for listening. Until next week, everyone. Have a great week.